I'll say good evening to everyone on the Rat Pack tonight. Uh, uh, this is Rob Macedo, KD1CY. I'm the Director of Operations for the VOIP Hurricane Net and also the Eastern Mass Aries Section Emergency Coordinator and Sky One Coordinator for our NWS Forecast Office in Norton, Mass. So uh, I know tonight we want to talk a bit about the Amateur Radio Workshop um, uh, at the National Hurricane Conference from this past year. And what I decided to do is I wanted to, uh, rather than rehash the entire workshop, which is um, basically three and a half hours long and, you know, not going to rehash that in an hour, I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about how we plan the workshops, how we execute them. I'll kind of give a high level pitch on the topics that we covered, some of the presenters we have, kind of how we do um, and come up with our presenters each year, talk a little bit about what we might want to do for future uh, workshops give some history about it, et cetera. And then I'm going to pivot a little bit into preparations for the upcoming uh, hurricane season and some events that are uh, uh, coming up, um, some of which weren't weren't known uh, uh, at the time of the workshop, which was earlier this year uh, in, in late March. So, um, so going to our, our next slide here. So um, we have a planning team that basically puts together the conference each year and, um, it's been uh, largely the same group. A few uh, folks actually uh, joined in over the years, and a few um, are, are more in an auxiliary role here um, uh, in more recent years. But um, I've been involved in the conference and presenting and planning of in, in some form uh, since 2008. Um, our planning team today consists of uh, Julio Rapol, WD4R, who's the um, amateur radio station at the National Hurricane Center uh, assistant coordinator, um, myself, Bobby Graves, who's on tonight, net manager from the Hurricane Watch Net, um, Bob Robichaud, who's also an amateur operator, VE1MBR. He is the warning preparedness meteorologist for the Canadian Hurricane Center. Um, believe it or not, Atlantic Canada has been a bit of a, a hurricane alley here in the last few years, as much as the Gulf and other areas Um They've been hit quite hard with hurricanes here in the last few years, specifically um, uh, Fiona in um, 2022, um, Larry in 2021, Dorian in 2019. Um, so they've actually had quite a few um, impacts here in recent years. Um, um, Fiona arguably was the largest one they've had um, in their history um, with some rival to um, Hurricane Juan in 2003, which was the hurricane that affected Nova Scotia that actually was the genesis of the Canadian Hurricane Center um, in uh, around the 2006 or 7 time frame. Um, Bill Feast, WBABZH, he's part of uh, Saturn. Um, and then we've always had strong, good support from the ARRL, currently with Josh, um, uh, KE5MHV, and I'll fix his uh, call sign here uh, uh, before I send out the presentation. We've also had a lot of help from Ken Bailey, K1FUG, and then Jim Palmer, who resides here in Massachusetts, uh, part of our Airy Skywarn team here in Massachusetts, and has helped out in the past with the VOIP Hurricane Net. He's the one that does all of the videography and the live streaming. Um, that's his actual professional day job at PBD Access Television. And then I want to give a shout out to... Um, a couple of past ARL headquarters supporters, um, Mike Corey, KI1U, um, former ARL manager of preparedness and response. He now is at FEMA Region 1 Emergency Communications. So we are enjoying a uh, rebirth of amateur radio connectivity to FEMA in the New England area. Um, and I can't think of a better guy than Mike to be there. And uh, also uh, Dennis Dura, K2DCD, he's actually on my VOIP Hurricane Net Management Team, also former ARL Manager of Preparedness and Response. So um, um, they've been involved in planning um, at various points, Dennis in the uh, earlier years, 2008 to 2010, and then Mike uh, was kind of involved through much of the 2010s, um, um, uh, right up until uh, before the uh, pandemic. Um, uh, we typically have two to three coordination planning calls that lead up to the National Hurricane Conference Amateur Radio Workshop. Um, you see a number of the same folks that are on the planning committee um, uh, also serve as speakers with Jim kind of providing that the videographer live stream work. He, he, he tends to be the person that grabs the questions from the online feeds and, and send it to us. Um, 
So he, he's kind of involved in that aspect of it, not so much as a speaker, but kind of helps to coordinate, um, especially when we are, are doing sessions in a, in a hybrid mode. Um, and then our team will pick a speaker from the local area where the conference is held to try to give a local flavor to what we're kind of providing as a a a, a more regional national view of things. Um, this past year, we we picked Rick Palm, who is the Aries um, letter editor, but he had direct impacts from Hurricane Adalia, so he was able to kind of give a a story of how he went from kind of an amateur radio responder to kind of somebody that had to deal with quite a bit of damage on his property um, as he was right near the core of uh, of uh, Hurricane Adalia. And we also coordinate the raffle prizes for those that attend the conference. And, and in 2021 and 2022, in those pandemic kind of years, um, we did the conference workshop uh, virtually, and I thought that worked very well. Um, and we even did the raffle prizes. We even found an online way to do the raffles um, for folks. And then the, the the prizes were actually mailed to them. In 2020, there was no conference. Uh, so there was no um, uh, workshop uh, in that year. And that's the only year that uh, we gapped out um, in terms of uh, con conferences. Um, so the conference has always had this amateur radio workshop, even before 2008. Um, there were others involved. I don't know all the history of everybody that was involved prior to 2008. At one point, the ARRL had a booth at the conference. Um, the original organizers of the conference that were part of the Tate family, the, um, uh, um, Lisa Tate's husband, I believe, was an amateur radio operator himself, and he strongly believed in amateur radio's mission during hurricanes. And that's why we've had this workshop going back even before 2008 and through the present time, the Tate family has continued the tradition. Um, within the last couple of years, sadly, we lost Lisa Tate, who was one of our main contacts. Um, I believe it's um, her nephew that has kind of picked up and continued the the, the tradition and also uh, for coordinating the overall conference and also working with us. And, you know, this year it was greatly improved in terms of internet connectivity. We've had problems since the pandemic where, we just didn't have the speed to really live stream to the point where we kind of really backed off on pushing whether we were going to do a live have a live stream available um, for this year. Um, but the conference really came through. We had spectacular connectivity and not a gl really a glitch at all in the live stream in this past workshop. And we had and I'll go through some of the attendee numbers and all of the workshop video, um, the entire video of the workshop is online as are uh, a couple of the prior years and um, years before 2021, um, we have the uh, the videos available. An original page that we had, I think um, that was hosted by um, the North Shore Radio Association um, uh, went kind of defunct because it used a lot of old um, flash technology. We have a lot of those videos and we can probably start posting them as we've posted a lot of the other more recent videos uh, on YouTube. And as we kind of look through future planning for the workshop, we're going to want to continue the kind of traditional amateur radio driven for amateur radio kind of workshop session um, that we've been doing. Um, but I think we also want to try to reach, we did have a few participants from the conference, from the emergency management community in various departments. We'd like to kind of have a session that's really geared towards them. Um, try to get them there. I, I have some ideas in my mind that we'll work with the team on about what kind of topic it is, work with the conference planners on it. Probably, you know, the blocks of sessions at the conference are usually 90 minutes. It'd be like one 90 minute session geared towards them that we could um, uh, get them there and try to give them basically the best use cases for amateur radio in their operations. Um, obviously when they lose um, layers of communication and have that kind of last line of defense, but also to kind of utilize us, especially in a situational awareness, disaster intelligence kind of method, which I think is forgotten. And we really need to stress because communications don't fail as much as they did 10 years ago or 20 years ago, but it still happens. We still have rural areas that don't have a lot of communication layers, but we need to kind of also embrace an additional mission so that we can keep that other core mission of having communications when things uh, fail relevant. And, you know, a big shout out to the National Hurricane Conference uh, organizers. Um, 
they help um, and support us over many years and, and have allowed the workshop for many years and it will continue for many years to come. And, you know, it, you know, expenses at these hotels are going higher and higher. It's making it harder for these conferences to exist, yet they still make sure they offer space for us and support us, like with the internet connectivity that we had this year, et cetera. So, you know, just a shout out to them for their help and support and allowing us to get the mission out at a, at a high uh, profile conference. So you'll see here that this was the conference agenda, um, you know, and I'll talk through a couple of differences from this year um, versus um, uh, prior years. We had John Kangielosi from the National Hurricane Center, the senior hurricane specialist, talk about the prior year re in review and how important the surface reports are. Uh, uh, to the Hurricane Center. Um, it's typically been a hurricane specialist or the di director of the National Hurricane Center that has done um, uh, that segment. Um, he, we went a little bit deeper this year with the hurricane specialist because Bob, uh, VE1MBR, this was the first conference that he's missed since 2008 um, outside of the pandemic years. And um, he had a personal conflict, so we just had him record a, a video um, the other uh, difference in the agenda was we had um, W1WCN who gave the um, sa gave a Saturn video um, to cover Saturn because um, Bill Feast could not make the uh, session in in Florida. So, um, and then you see the overviews from on the Hurricane Center amateur radio station from WD4R Julio, Bobby with the Hurricane Washnet, and myself with the VOIP Hurricane Net, and kind of a best practices in Skywarn for tropical systems that. Um, uh, aren't hurricanes, but are tropical storms or remnant systems that can sometimes cause uh, fairly significant issues in a local or uh, regionalized uh, area and, and localized Skyward activations. So this is uh, the group of presenters uh, from uh, this year. And you'll see that Julio presented everyone with recognition certificates for supporting the workshop. Um, and we're grateful to Julio for providing that. I talked about Bob and John and, and kind of what the presentations were there. And, and Rick gave a, a really good presentation on the direct impacts of Adalia to him. Um, and I'm going to, that's the one segment I'm going to talk a little bit more about here tonight is about Hurricane Adalia and some of the challenges that we had there. And, and what can, and, you know, you think about, oh, there's tons of weather stations and surface observations and social media and all that, but, you know, I can, I'll be honest, there still are holes in the area and we can still augment a lot of, of what is out there um, by putting our kind of trained eyes on, it, especially if we're trained in Skywarn, et cetera, our abilities to monitor um, radio frequencies properly, et cetera, can help really bring kind of a treasure trove of preliminary surface data that can be very critical in the overall process of knowing the final strengths of these systems post event and 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 what happened in these events um you'll see in this slide here i have the link to the 2024 uh, amateur radio uh, workshop um uh, that recording which was the same stream as the live stream you can see the link to it there um as you heard earlier i'll have the slides over uh, and so that they can be part of the and and uploaded on the rat pack site so you'll be able to get all these links um, the current workshop that we um, put on has already had 740 views on YouTube, and this is only about a month since the conference was held, a little under a month, actually. Um, and roughly 80 were viewing it in near real time. It was basically between 70 to 80 folks at the at the peak. Um, so really not uh, recording this, whether we, it's great when we have it on live stream and recording, but it, at the very minimum recording it, we can get a lot of people to watch it um, afterwards and, you know, gain a lot of information um, from the, the workshop. You'll see some of the prior uh, uh, Hurricane Conference Amateur Radio Workshop videos that are available. So you can go back and look at some of the prior years. And we do cover some of the different hurricanes from those seasons, et cetera. Um, there's some different speakers, um, for example, in the uh, in the 2021 and 2022 seasons, um, we had Ken Graham, who was the director of the National Hurricane Center uh, in those years. He's now the director of the entire National Weather Service, and he is a ham, WX4KEG. So um, 
Uh, you can capture some information from different presenters and videos that you you wouldn't be able to uh, capture otherwise. And and as I said, we do have a lot of the older workshop videos. Um, if there's any interest in those, we can likely produce them. And and I think we should start looking at putting them out on um, uh, uh, YouTube. As I said, there was no um, conference or workshop in 2020 due to the uh, uh, pandemic. So that was the one year that there was a a total gap. Um, and then, like I said, 21 and 22, we we held them um, virtual only. So now I'm going to shift gears a little bit. Um, Phil Klotzbeck was at the conference. Um, the conference was actually before his official forecast, but um, between Phil Klotzbeck and John Cangiolosi and um, Bob Robichaud, we were getting an idea that it, it, it had, the forecast was going to be for a pretty significant um, hurricane season to come. And that's exactly what was forecasted. I believe this is the highest forecast that Colorado State had ever issued um, for their April forecast. So now, you know, there's always the caveats, right? If all of these 23 named storms and 11 hurricanes are all out in the ocean, it might be very busy in terms of the numbers, but the impacts will be very low. But obviously, when you have a lot of systems, it, it can mean that um, we could have a lot of landfalling impacts around our coastline. So um, just want to give a shout out to folks that are in these um, coastal areas or or even within, a, you know, a couple of hundred miles inland of, 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 of where you could potentially get a landfalling tropical system. You know, think about your preparedness um, on, on a personal level first. And then after you think about your personal preparedness and, and, and have those materials and, and things ready, then think about how you, can you help the um, WX4NHC, our, the Hurricane Watch Net, the VOIP Hurricane Net, your local area Skywarn teams, et cetera, um, for the various missions that we uh, do um, for communications, whether it be additional communication layers, um, even when some are active, when they go down, the situational awareness mission, you know, the the, the need for data on what's actually happening on the ground, damage, uh, damaging conditions, um, et cetera, as well as the meteorological data. And keep in mind that strong tropical storms and remnant systems um, can pack more of a, of a punch than you might realize in some situations and being ready to be prepared for those. So you see the numbers here. I believe this forecast will be updated in June. The NOAA forecast comes out in mid-May, but we're already thinking in the... Um, as we sometimes call ourselves the hurricane ham community, um, we are already in a mode of thinking about and preparing for a very active season and um, being ready um, to have the right level of resources, et cetera, to help support um, this upcoming hurricane season. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of those preparations now. Um, I reached out to Julio and I told him I was presenting tonight at the Rat Pack. So I want to mention um, the WX4 NHC on-air communications test. It's going to be Saturday, May 25th, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. So let's. Be, I want to be very clear on what the on-air test is and what it isn't. Um, it is not an emergency exercise, an EOC exercise, or formal net event, or a contest. Um, they will get on the air. They will be on um, the HF frequencies for Hurricane Watchnet, 14325 upper sideband, 7268 um, lower sideband. Um, but they may be in and out. And, um, and the reason for that is they're testing a lot of their equipment. They may make adjustments to antennas. They may be on different modes or switching off um, abruptly because they have this one day period to kind of get all their testing done, get all their adjustments done, and then... Um, be ready for the season, but they will be making uh, contacts um, and checking in with folks as a means to kind of see if all the equipment is working. Um, the Hurricane Center will be on um, Echo Link and IRLP. Um, typically, it's at the 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time time window. That time window could change, so I called it a typical time frame. Um, more details uh, will follow um, on the test in early May, um, but wanted to at least get the date out there and kind of what the test is and what isn't to folks so um, people know that it's coming and that they can participate um, and help the Hurricane Center um, test out um, their all the amateur radio uh, equipment. So um, there'll be more to follow. I'm sure there will be ARL postings and postings uh, on our site, on the HWN site, et cetera. 
but want to at least get the word out um, uh, from Julio about the test and some of the details around it um, on its purpose, et cetera. So now I want to talk a little bit about Hurricane Adalia because it was the uh, one uh, landfalling U.S. system. We had a lot of active um, uh, systems and powerful systems in um, the Eastern Pacific. That's part of the uh, presentation in the workshop. We had yet another tropical to kind of transitioning post-tropical cyclone that affected um, affected the fringe parts of actually of New England. We had um, some tropical storm force conditions on Cape Cod and up in Maine with the main impacts uh, up in the Canadian Maritimes. That was post-tropical cyclone Lee. Um, some of that is talked about in the overall workshop presentation, but I did want to spend a few minutes around Adalia, which I also talked about in the workshop. Um, this was an, uh, a hurricane. It was weakening at the time of landfall. However, you know, we still had several hundred thousand in lost power uh, from the Big Bend of Florida into Georgia. But the hurricane hit a real a rural area, um, despite Florida being, uh, you know, you know, a mecca of hurricanes uh, across the state. Seems like Florida's hit at least once every year. Um, it was a fairly rare incident for the area that was affected, which is around the Perry, Florida area. One of the key reports we had from the VOIP hurricane net um, was from an amateur radio operator in Key West who relayed information uh, from an amateur radio operator he knew in Perry, Florida. Um, Rick Palm, who I mentioned, presented at the workshop, he had damage and relayed his reports into the hurricane watch net. So just giving uh, examples of the two nets and the two modes that people were able to uh, communicate and pass along the damage that occurred in their area. So this was a map, and this is showing um, some of the Davis weather stations that were in the area. So you can see there wasn't much in the area. Um, there were no coastal weather stations. The nearest station was an airport ASOS in Perry, which is a decent amount inland um, from uh, where the landfall point was with, with, with Adalia. And this underscores some of the importance of surface observations and um, much of this area is uh, a wildlife refuge, et cetera, kind of the first major community that Adalia was really able to impact directly as a hurricane was Perry, Florida. Um, so um, it just shows you some of the challenges, even in the the very populous and, you know, all these weather stations that we have in, 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 in the United States. There can still be areas where there can be kind of a considerable gap from where the core of the hurricane force winds are going to be and where there are observations. This was even noted in the National Hurricane Center um, report. It said the estimated peak intensity at landfall is 100 knots, but there is some uncertainty around the value given the lack of surface data and the ongoing structural evolution of Adalia at that time. Um, so, um, you know, I... I as, as some folks know, I have a personal relationship with Jim Cantori, and I, I we try to help him when he's out in um, storms with some of the amateur radio related data, et cetera. And, and you know, he was like, ah, there was no 100 mile per hour plus wind gusts. And I says, well, part of it was there was no weather stations out there to measure it. Um, um, I believe there were at least 100 mile per hour wind gusts. I don't know if it's sustained winds may have reached 100 knots or not. So, but it brings a lot of questions of, well, what was the real intensity at landfall? You know, there was weakening for sure, but how much weakening? There was structural damage in Perry where, you know, it, it, I, I think indicates at least um, 100 plus mile per hour wind gusts. So these are some of the damage photos. Um, this was a Dollar Tree store with some of the structural damage to the buildings, some additional structure damage to buildings out in the Perry, Florida area, uh, some damage around a, a gas station. You know, I think this was indicative that you did have some of those higher end um, hurricane force wind gusts in parts of Perry, Florida. See some more structural damage in these pictures here and obviously lots of tree damage. You know, just giving an idea and, and when we get these photos, um, when it's safe to do so in near real time or shortly after the hurricane has passed, it's really helpful in figuring out um, what's the damage that we have um, uh, in the affected area and um, what does it mean in terms of the overall hurricane intensity? Um, so um, walk through that because I think it was a good segue to we are always looking for ground truth surface reports from stations in the affected area. Um, we, we are looking for, you know, for measured data that meets the Skyward reporting criteria, but certainly wind damage reports, 
storm related damage, uh, storm surge flooding, river stream urban flooding from heavy rainfall, any pictures and videos that can be provided. These are all things that are very helpful in incident. Um, you know, the other thing that I'll talk a little bit about also is is if you're able to monitor your local public safety and you're able to monitor it correctly, you know, getting the information off of those feeds, um, whether it's live scanners or scanners online, um, and noting the first responder reports of what's actually happening at the location that they're at can give a picture of what's going on to the hurricane specialists, local weather service forecasters, and and um, others so that they see what's what's really going on. Monitoring some of the online weather stations. There's lots of them, but some of them, they may, their wind instruments may not be high enough to measure the highest winds. You know, getting those reports into us and then we can kind of at least give a kind of first round vetting of, is the, is the data correct? Does it look correct? Is it too high, et cetera? We can kind of look at that before we then um, submit it to the hurricane specialist. And it kind of goes through a couple of layers, both, both um, on our nets, um, whether it's Hurricane WatchNet or the VOIP Hurricane Net, and then through the operators at the uh, uh, Hurricane Center. So getting the, you know, the stations um, on air, and, and even if you're passing it to the Weather Service office, it may be some time before they get it to the Hurricane Center and others. So um, if we're getting a lot of that information and we can funnel it in the Hurricane Center, it gives everybody that same um, operational picture. Um, um, and and I think the ground truth surface reporting, some of this relaying from a situational awareness perspective is a another kind of force multiplier in that mission that allows us to be there when those traditional means of communications uh, fail. And that's really the the top two missions of, of the Hurricane Center uh, Amateur Radio Station the Hurricane Watch Net and VOIP Hurricane Net. The other thing I'll mention is, um, and that's uh, myself at my uh, amateur station from a few uh, years ago, um, we are always looking for net controls and liaison stations for our nets um, to take shifts at net control. Um, Bobby has kind of a process on how he brings in his net controls, as, as do we at the VOIP Hurricane Net. Um, they're a little bit different uh, between the two based on the needs. Um, you know, it can be taking shifts of net control, monitoring other nets, frequency, modes of operation for surface reporting. And I talked about some of the, the public safety online weather stations, even social media, you know, kind of vetting that data out um, and, and, and seeing if that is precise. You know, there's some very good data out on social media and there's some very not so good information out there in social media, whether it be bad actors or people that are genuinely trying to help, but not seeing exactly not see they're seeing something that isn't really there or not fully detailed on what's really there based on what they're looking at um so that's part of the eyes and, and experience that we can bring to the table especially if if we've been doing this kind of work for a long period of time and then of course liaison to other amateur radio nets without interfering with those nets uh, but being able to monitor those on hf vhf uhf other local nets that may have internet linking, but maybe not don't want to come onto a, a larger net, but they may allow for one or two of, in our net management, in our net communities to be able to monitor them, to hear what's going on, can be ways to get information up um, to folks. So we're always looking for these kind of net controls and liaison stations for the various nets. Um, we do have a hurricane prep net um, that meets monthly December to May at 8 p.m., on WX Talk Echo Link Conference uh, 7203, IRLP 9219. Um, and we also have um, um, that net, our net that goes, it will shift to weekly in the hurricane season months of June to November at 8 p.m. So um, wanted to give um, some additional information on kind of the needs of the uh, hurricane net um, um, community and, um, and, and so forth. So wanted to pass that along. These are some, these are the, Links to the um, WX4NHC Amateur Radio Station, the Hurricane Watch Net, the VOIP Hurricane Net, um, and um, contacts uh, for myself, Bobby, and Julio uh, uh, to reach out on the various operations of the Amateur Radio Station and the uh, different um, Hurricane Nets. Um, and uh, in closing, so I, I, I got we got a kind of a rare photo here and a little bit of a, what I called an ARL National Headquarter History Lesson. So. These are, um, and I know we did have Paul Gilbert for a period of time, um, but he wasn't um, present. This is at the Northeast Ham Exposition last year. Um, and you see the prior uh, managers of emergency preparedness and response on the left, Dennis Dura, who is um, 
I'm first into the role, followed by KI1U, Mike Corey, and then Josh Johnston, KE5MHV. Um, uh, Josh, who is our current director of emergency management with some restructuring in the organization that um, bumped this position up a level, which I think was was very important to do. Yeah, I have great respect for all three of these guys and what they have done for our program. I think each one has left an impression and, and kind of moved the program forward. Um, Josh has been great, and we definitely have enjoyed uh, working with him um, over the over the last uh, a couple of years now. And definitely has brought, I think, a lot of good local emergency management experience um, 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 to uh, league headquarters, et cetera. So, um, like I said, three great people have done a great job um, in what's been, I think, a, a challenging role at times uh, for for those that are in it. And, and um, it's been great to work with all of them. And then I just want to give my thanks to all of you that support your your local and regional Skywarn programs or have helped out uh, with us for uh, during uh, hurricanes and uh, um, whether it's surface reporting, net control work, et cetera, we very much appreciate it. Um, spread the word. We're looking for more help, uh, both on surface observing, net controls, and other uh, support. Um, uh, and I you know, very feel very strongly that we uh, can help um, the mission um, both uh, for Skywarn at the local level as well as the national level and support what the Hurricane Center does in their operation um, during hurricanes. So um, uh, that's uh, the presentation here. Um, I see a few things in the chat. I'll see if they're, uh, those are questions of any kind, and I'll, I'll try to address those, and then I'll open, open it up to um, um, other questions. So I see that um, Carolyn, uh, KC6COB, um, how can you tell so far in advance to for to forecast so far in advance? Can the uh, hurricanes be seen already in the ocean far away? So it's not so much that they look at um they they are basically looking at long term uh, longer term weather patterns and what the models are forecasting. So for example, we've been in an El Nino pattern, which has a tendency to reduce um Atlantic hurricane season activity. Um, it was blunted a bit last year because the Atlantic Ocean was so warm that we still had the, the shear conditions that kind of rip apart the hurricanes um, or any tropical systems that try to develop. That's going to wane and kind of turn into La Nina, which allows for better development in the main development regions of the Atlantic for hurricanes, which is why they're increasing the numbers. So they're looking at kind of longer term cycles and patterns and the model data that supports that. Um, they're not necessarily... Um, seeing things that are that that are already out there that are very far out in time or knowing exact days or whatever um and track of systems it's more about trends and what's what's out there so that's one factor is is switching over to la nina the atlantic which was warm last year is even much warmer this year um maybe in some cases the warmest on record in some areas and that's another factor in determining why the season could be an extremely uh 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 active one um so um so that's um that one i think barry your comments on uh sanibel island and and southwest uh, uh florida i think you're thinking of hurricane ian from 2022 and that one definitely had a bit of a track change that was kind of last minute not a big one but big enough on on the area that was impacted um and and that's uh uh um one there that um um it was memorable for that uh, uh, reason. Um, and I see, I think just a comment um, from Jerry around satellites providing a lot of info and they certainly do um, as long uh, along with the uh, 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 Caribbean uh, and all of the kind of hurricane hunter uh, aircraft flights, which are not only into the systems and they're, they're now manned aircraft. There are now drones that they fly into the uh, systems and they're also flying around the systems to try to get an idea of the environment and be able to tell, help with the track and intensity forecasts, which track forecasts have been, continue to be improved for the most part, still challenges with one or two storms here or there, but they've been improved greatly. Intensity forecasting though still remains a big challenge that they're still working on improvements and there have been improvements there, but not as significant um, as they've been um, uh, for track guidance. Um, I see uh, Gene and 3 xus has raised his hand. So we'll go to him next after looking through the, uh, the uh, chat box. We're all good. Yeah, good evening everybody from uh, Colleen, Texas. This is N3XUS. Um, 
from a tech point of view, who has privileges on VHF, UHF, and limited SSP on 10, and they're not a member of any like served agency, they're not a member of uh, Aries or a county OEM or the Red Cross or anything like that, how can they send reports, real-time reports, and also to whom can they send via UHF, VHF? It doesn't seem to be like a standard that, okay, during this type of weather phenomenon uh, with grants from the FCC, these particular frequencies are for hurricane reporting uh, within that specific geographical region. Yeah. So, so for so we'll just start with um, I'm going to start with general weather events first. I you know you're in um, sounds like you're in Texas. There are likely local skywarn frequencies that you would report into for those um, incidents, and those and they may also be active in hurricane situations. And you should be able to check in with to those with. Um, reports that beat their criteria and and you know each local area may operate a little bit differently so they may have um a criteria that they that they follow that has some slight differences to what i talked through so it, it can vary a little bit by local area and and hazard but um you know at the local level there there should be frequencies in your area that you can monitor during hurricanes those local nets may also be active and then there's there's just added net capability. So the Hurricane Watch Net on 14325 upper sideband or 7268 lower sideband would be active. And our net would be active on Echo Link and IRLP. And while understanding you're not on HF, so you couldn't get to the watch net based on those frequencies. You can get on VHF, UHF, and if there's Echo Link, if Echo Link and IRLP nodes on, on any of the local area repeaters, you could connect um to the Echolink WX Talk Conference or IRLP 9219 as a means to reach our net. You could also have Echolink on your PC or or there's even now a web app that you can use. And if you watch the amateur radio workshop um video, um I talk through here's the different ways you can get on Echolink, how you get on a RRLP. I go through the new web app um Echolink system that's available. You can even load the Echolink app on your cell phone. Um, and as a tech, you're able to to do that. So those are some of the ways that you could um, uh, communicate. I can't be more specific because I don't know the frequencies in your area, but I can at least tell you for hurricanes, you have your local nets that are probably active. And then our nets kind of come in as another means to uh, communicate both the hurricane watch net and the, and the VOIP net. And from a tech class license perspective, you may be able to get to us a little bit more easily because... Um, uh, you would you might be able to link up a VHF UHF repeater in your area to our net, or use Echolink to uh, contact us directly. All right, who has uh, the authority to uh, announce or state that a specific, uh, let's say, a repeater system can only be used for emergency situations where it's day to day normal operation type of thing? Who who can and by what authority can an individual say, okay, this repeater can only be used for traffic concerning, uh, let's say, a weather emergency. So, so that would be up to the repeater owner, and obviously, the repeater owner would work with your local Aries group or or emergency management group, and they would they would designate that make that designation but it would ultimately reside with the repeater owner but they would typically coordinate with the um um with the uh local aries or ema group depending on the depending on the area all right thank you all right um barry i did you have a comment um i thought you were trying to jump in as uh gene asked his question If you're talking, Barry, you're on mute or. Push the right button here. Yes, I mentioned well, every, the most local places have a designated Skywarn net. And you don't necessarily have to be Skywarn trained to check into the net. It's open to everybody usually. But the Skywarn trained people get a little bit more priority because they've gone through the training of the national local uh, weather weather service to be able to gather the specific data they're looking for. And uh, we used to go to the weather service and we used to have an amateur in the actual local weather service 
to man the amateur radio to give them uh, reports. Nowadays, they just get it remotely. Yep, and all that's true. And, and we still have our amateur radio station at our weather service office. We don't go there as often as we used to, but it is there. And, and certainly when we get into these higher end situations where you could lose the infrastructure and lose the remoteness, that's when uh, you you, you want to be on site in, in those uh, uh, situations. Um, so, um, uh, so thanks for that, Barry. So um, I think I've gone through the questions in chat and the hands that were raised. Are there any other questions? I have a comment if I could add in. Absolutely, Jerry. Go ahead. At uh, Baltimore, Washington, we have a station in the National Weather Service office. We have uh, three VHF stations, a UHF and uh, two HF uh, with a tri-band beam and a 48-meter loop. Uh, I have uh, 13 uh, subnets around the area to cover the whole area. We cover 13 uh Maryland counties, eight West Virginia counties, and uh, 23 Virginia counties, plus the District of Columbia, 10 million people. And uh, we have found that hurricanes do not just follow the coast. Uh, Garrett County, Sandy, when, when Sandy came through, Garrett County, which is our far, far northwest corner of Maryland, lost 85% of all power and communications. Um. Uh, the Skywarn nets are very important here, and uh, we invite anyone to check in. Uh, once during a hurricane, we will have somebody at the office to provide communication, direct communication to the uh, National Hurricane Center, the Hurricane Watch Net, uh, should there be a failure of communications at the office. But yeah, right. the Skywarn nets are very important, and they are the ones that uh, uh, we handle uh hurricane traffic and we want people to check in yep yeah, absolutely and it's a similar similar setup here for the nws norton office we have roughly a dozen um sometimes uh more it's at least a dozen i counted on a rough uh, uh counted them up in my head and, and a little bit more with some of our um, um backup and other frequencies that we can spin up in parallel when we need to um, we have over a dozen um, repeaters for Skywarn across um, our coverage areas, all, all of Massachusetts, except for Berkshire County, all of Rhode Island, and uh, the state of, and, and uh, three counties in northern Connecticut. In Rhode Island, it's actually um, several repeaters and one kind of link system kind of brings um, all of the state of Rhode Island um, together um, uh, uh, from that perspective. Um, and we're all hazards, so we've activated for winter storms, we've activated for severe weather, hurricanes, etc. Um, what we try to do when we have uh, we have our Skywarn nets up during a hurricane, what we try to do is use both the Hurricane Watch Net with Bobby uh, and team and the VOIP Hurricane Net. We actually bring in, we have an Echolink IRLP system that's similar to um, what, the, what we run the VOIP Hurricane Net. We can connect them together. Um, so we can get to the Hurricane Center and bring in some of the reports that we would bring into that network and our local subnets up through there and into the Hurricane Center. And then we have um, folks um, that have checked in with Bobby on HF, and we have that ready in case we lose um, the VOIP comms. And we can do HF at the Weather Service. Um, our Weather Service station has two um, VHF, VHF, UHF dual band setups and one uh, HF uh, setup Um at the uh at our uh, office um uh and and our plan would be for a hurricane where you have the risk of communications infrastructure would be to to have someone uh at the uh, weather office for those uh communications um so um just in a view of the norton office which is uh similar to uh baltimore's with a little less um uh capability uh at the uh at the office station the only problem is being in a highly sensitive security area our computer system is on the internal government network so we can't install anything that's not gsa approved which means no voip uh, no echo link none of that yeah yeah the uh we we have what we have is we are actually have our own hotspot, and we 
we don't have a government computer. We just bring in um, our laptops, connect up to the hotspot, and that's how we're able to use um, uh, our Echo Echolink uh, capability there. Because um, like you say, you cannot use it on the uh, uh, on the government side. And unfortunately, uh, I'm retired. I can't afford to do a hotspot. Yeah, yeah, It, get, no. it can get very expensive very quickly. Yeah, it, it can. Um, the the setup we have, I have through Verizon. Um, they've actually changed it around so that you get unlimited data, but still, you got to have the you know the monthly um support for it. So that's that, and that can be uh, that can run it run into much. Um, yes. Um, it, you know, Bobby brings up a good point, and it's in the the Jerry. It's in the um um. It's in the uh, presentation, the overall workshop. There is the web browser version of Echolink. It's new. Um, was kind of, kind of launched late last year, early January timeframe. That may work for you. You may want to um take a look at it. Um, I don't know if it was. I've not tested it myself on a government um computer. But um, if you if you um look at our um workshop training and and um. look at our uh my my segment i kind of walk through the web echo link uh, uh app address etc and uh it may be worth a shot I'd be curious to know if that would work there's some information in chat that everybody needs to be looking at also yeah i saw the uh, chat on and there are various skyworn uh sessions um going on um believe it or not at our office we're only offering a handful this year due to some staff shortages at nws and most of ours are full um but there is some central pennsylvania skyworn training online webinar classes both um basic and advanced uh that you can see there our classes are actually the live versions they did do a recording of a virtual class that's also available and some classes that we've taught in the amateur radio community with the weather service um uh, support they've allowed us to teach training classes in the past we've we've recorded those and we have them online um on our website um and i'll uh, put it in the chat but it's um our amateur radio call sign uh, wx1box.org um and um um, and I've put it that in the uh, in the chat uh, for folks to um, check out. Um, other questions? One more thing. My my warning is meteorologists down here want to distress for all of us. It's not just the wind for a storm. The meteorologists now are emphasizing storm surge. We have to pay attention to the storm surge because that's where most of the lives are lost and most of the damage happens. The winds do some, but the water does even worse. So we wanted to be sure that we all follow the storm surge for forecasts, which are fairly new on the National Weather Service. So back to you, Rob. Yeah, no, um, and um, uh, I the storm surge is, you know, there are storm surge watches and warnings that are um, uh, now issued by the Hurricane Center. And... Um, We've seen some of the significant damage on on the um, storm surge. Um, and Barry mentioned Sanibel Island and stuff from Ian back in uh, 2022. Some of the areas impacted around the Naples area and up through uh, um, Cape Coral, et cetera. You know, it's very damaging and and definitely something that if you're in that area, um, you know, if you're in that area you, you know, of the coast, you definitely need to. take the precautions and even, you know, move out of that area. Some of the storm surge flooding videos and stuff that are available out there are actually from storm chasers that actually pre-positioned equipment knowing they might lose it and then got out of the area, but monitored it during the event. Um, that's how we got some of those um, uh, storm surge videos that are out there. Um, any other questions tonight? Crickets, crickets, crickets. <laughs> I think we did good. It was a good presentation. Yeah, it's All right. a great, great presentation. And uh, <laughs> it's super. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. No, thank you. And Lem, good to see you on from our local area of Cape Cod. Um, our Cape Cod Aries group is one of our strongest in the region, and that's because they're usually the ones hardest hit um, and are, are the most active with um, – uh real operations um 
and it's been a little bit long since you guys have had uh, an operation now, so uh, uh, you don't want to be overdue because then it's usually a, a much longer <laughs> activation and engagement. So anyways, it was great to be here tonight. I hope this was helpful. Like I said, I tried to do a high-level overview and touch a little bit of the workshop without overlapping the whole thing. Please um, check out the whole workshop video when you can. You can watch it at your leisure. Uh, it's, it's about three and a half hours, so you can split it up over time when you when you have it. And, uh, you know, especially on those rainy days. Um, and I hope everybody has a great night. And uh, maybe we'll catch some of you on the airways. Uh, or uh, if you're interested in supporting um, the hurricane uh, nets and programs out there, uh, uh, you know who to contact. Thank you very much, Rob. If you're watching right now, Rob, just in case you haven't seen it. What's that? The little blob in the Atlantic right now that they're watching, in case you yes, haven't seen it. Yes, yeah, 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 I did see it. Um, but thankfully, I don't think that'll amount to much. But just the fact that you got something in April, right, that just gives you an idea of, of what, what may be upcoming as things get warmer. So, uh, again, could be an active year, and so um, we'll need to be ready. Okay. Let's give some last shouts out there. Anybody else got any questions, answers, comments? Just one other question. How do I find out about next year's uh, uh, net uh, or uh, seminar? Uh, that's a good question. And you can, it's, it's in New Orleans next year. The dates are already set on um, the exact date of the, um, of the amateur radio workshop won't be set till probably like, you know, three or four months prior, but that's the link right there. And Bobby put it in the link as well. Hurricane meeting.com. So get down to bourbon street about three days before and stay three days after. Well, there you go. That's, <laughs> that's one way to do it. Appreciate that. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Well, it's been a great presentation. Really appreciate you doing this. And out to all the people that I know on this, on here, a lot of people, a lot of familiar faces. Well, if there's nothing else, I will pull the plug. Wish everybody a 73 and uh, look forward to seeing you on tomorrow night. Thank you all. Stay safe, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night. Good seeing you, Dan.